Welcome everyone to the SSE uh, Q4 webinar. Uh, today we have a special webinar where we are focused on gender equality on corporate boards. And in particular, we're launching today our annual benchmark report for G20 markets. But this year, we also did research on an additional 35 markets around the world where we looked at some of the top five biggest markets by market capitalization from seven different regions or country groupings. So we're very excited to have with us today representatives from some of the exchanges included in this study, as well as our good colleagues from the IFC and UN Women, who, or, whose organizations supported and backed these studies. And so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna dive into the agenda. Um, we'll go to the next slide, here we are. So just a general overview uh, for, the, uh, for the agenda today. Again, we've got two reports. So we're gonna have a presentation. Uh, in the chat box, we've already put the links to the reports so you can find them and download them. They are very short data-centric reports. Really, they're only about two or three pages. And frankly, the engine room of the report, the real heart of the report, is the table that you'll find uh, on the second or third page of the report, where it provides all the data about women on boards, as well as women in uh, positions, uh, chair position and CEO position, as well as some other uh, useful information uh, related to that, which we'll hear more from in a moment, uh, in the uh, detailed presentation of the data from my colleague, Lisa Remka, the deputy coordinator of the UNSSE. So uh, let me just go to the next slide. Just to, just to say that we have uh, we'll, we have an hour today, so I think we have plenty of time. Uh, for, there'll be opportunities at the end, I think, for some Q and A with the audience. Uh, throughout the presentations today, throughout the conversations today, if anybody in the audience has got a question, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box at any time. And we will pick up that question. We can direct that question to one of our speakers on the call today, um, or we'll address it ourselves. Uh, it, the exchanges on the call, we're happy to also hear from you. Uh, I think we're going to have some time at the end during the Q&A period. So if you, if you wanted to tell us a little bit more about what your exchange is doing to advance gender equality in your marketplace, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, all, I think... Almost all of the exchanges on the call, you will be familiar with our Ring the Bell for Gender Equality events. These started back in 2015 with only seven exchanges participating in them. And today, I mean, for the last three plus years, we've had well over 100 exchanges around the world engaged in these events, enormously popular. But what we're really here to talk about is the results in the marketplace. So these kind of awareness raising events are, are very important. But at the end of the day, results matter. And so it's good to, that's what we're trying to do here is provide a little bit of a benchmark to help track progress over time. And we're committed to continue to do this type of research for the next, throughout the end of this decade to, to, to allow exchanges to track progress over time. Some of the exchanges are already tracking these kinds of metrics and we applaud you for doing that. I think it's very useful. We understand that exchanges don't have a magic wand that they can just to uh, make all of their issuers do whatever they want. And these are very complex topics that require many different actors in the marketplace and society to play a role. But we do encourage exchanges to do what they can to uh, encourage activity. And to that effect, we published earlier this year our guidance on how stock exchanges can advance gender equality in the marketplace with a number of actions that exchanges can take to kind of nudge their market in the right direction. And we'll hear more from our speakers today about what they're doing in their markets. Can we go to the next slide? So <clears throat> I think in terms of opening remarks, I think you've already heard from me uh, and about what we're doing and about these reports. So we do have two reports today and we apologize for publishing two reports on, that are so similar on the exact same day. Um, we hope that's not confusing, but uh, there are two different samples. Same methodology, two different samples. One, we're just looking at G20 markets, which is what we did last year, which is our normal annual benchmark. And then a broader set where we're looking at different regions around the world, including Southeast Asia, where we have a couple of speakers today. Indeed, all of our speakers today are from Southeast Asia, a very dynamic region 
that did relatively well in this study. So I think we're, there's some lessons there for all of us to learn from. So without any further ado, I, I'd like to go to our first speaker, our, our good colleague uh, from IFC, Amy, who's based in Hanoi and who has a view of the Hanoi Stock Exchange just outside her window. Amy, I'll <laughs> over to you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, it's such a pleasure for me to welcome you today to the launch of these two reports. Uh, this ranking of listed companies provides stock exchanges, regulators, and other stakeholders with critical baseline information about the state of gender equality in their markets. Um, the state of gender equality in these regional markets is very variable. And that's something we'll del delve into here in the presentations. But just to maybe share a few top line results, in the top market, women hold close to 45% of board seats, but it drops to less than 2% at the low end of the range. Among emerging markets, more than 20% of board seats are held by women in Malaysia, South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya. The highest proportion of female CEOs can be found in Africa with 9% of listed companies being led by women, followed by Southeast Asia, where I'm speaking to you today from, as Anthony mentioned, with only 8%. In terms of female board chairs, African markets have the second highest rate with 8%, and tied with European markets and behind the US NASDAQ which has about 16%. Now, most of these numbers show very significant room for improvement, uh, but the data itself is valuable. There's not enough publicly available data on leadership of listed companies, particularly in emerging markets. And this highlights a fundamental role that stock markets can play. Exchanges can improve transparency in capital markets by including gender indicators on disclosure of list or listing requirements, creating data points that highlight performance on gender equality. And having this sex disaggregated data on corporate leadership is really key. It helps us to build the business case for improved gender balance. It lets us know where we stand on gender balance. It also, if done consistently, helps us understand more about what works to improve gender balance. And I think the act of public reporting itself can spur change. It motivates the companies who are leading in gender diversity to keep at it, and it stimulates some competition among the others to catch up. There's also, we think, a self-reinforcing mechanism once a company makes improvements on diversity. They see it pay off. We know from numerous studies that we've done and that others have done that more gender equality in operations and in value chains means better talent retention and attraction. It means higher productivity, more innovation, more customers, better societal outcomes across the board. But companies do need the nudging. And that's where stock exchange have an important role to play. They influence markets. They can help facilitate inclusive growth by connecting policymakers, investors, and businesses. And they can drive change in a way that few other actors can. Now, of course, building gender equal private sector markets is a huge priority for, for IFC. We do this by conducting research on the business case for gender diverse business leadership. Um, we do it by building capacity of regulators and stock exchanges, for example, here in Vietnam, uh, where we collaborated with um, SSC as well as the two stock exchanges here and the State Securities Commission on the first corporate governance code for public companies, including best practice provision for at least two female members or 30% of female directors. We also help facilitate training for women directors directly, for example, in Brazil, where we partner with a stock exchange in a mentoring and training program. And very recently in recent years, by uh, very directly, by appointing women to a majority of the boards in which we have a nominee director spot. So it's clear from the, direct, uh, from the reports that we're launching today that there's a long ways to go to increase women's role in corporate decision-making. Uh, our continued collaboration with uh, SSE and UN, and UN Women and other organizations is critical to making progress. We're grateful for these partnerships and certainly great, grateful to all of you for spending some time with us today. We wish you a fruitful conversation. Back to you, Anthony. Thank you very much for that, Amy, and, and thank you for the background and, and really emphasizing the importance of these kinds of metrics and reporting that can help encourage improved behavior. I always say that there are a lot of very big challenges that the world faces that are very difficult to quantify, but gender equality is not one of them. 
Um, it's one of the spaces where we could use more transparency and metrics to help encourage uh, a positive um, a positive developments and positive uh, in competition, if you will, to improve this, this status in markets around the world. So with that in mind, I'd like to move to the star of the show, if you will, which are the numbers. And so I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, Lisa Remka, to walk us through these two different uh, reports that, uh, that we've just published today that you can also find the links for in your chat box. Um, so Lisa, please uh, walk us through this, this data that we've just put out. Thank you very much, Anthony. And uh, yeah, as you said, we have two reports today. So I'm going to jump right into the data. Amy already gave us a great teaser at the beginning of her remarks. Um, so um, I'm going to start with the G20 report. Um, you can see that here on the right hand side. Uh, this report takes a look at the issuers listed on exchanges located in G20 countries. Um, we considered only the largest exchanges within the G20 and then only took a look at the top 100 issuers by market capitalization. With these criteria, we ended up with a sample of 22 markets and 2,171 companies. And as Anthony mentioned earlier, this is actually the second iteration. And I'm going to show you uh, the data here, which Anthony mentioned is the star of the, of the show, really. So this is the second iteration of this kind of report. We already exam uh, examined the same kind of sample in 2021, and um, we are planning to do this kind of research over the coming years, really to establish trend lines and to create a benchmark for exchanges to see if their efforts in promoting women's participation in, uh, in public markets is taking, um, is taking effect. So this year we found that it's great news. This year we found that uh, women's um, overall participation on boards in G20 markets increased from 2021 by 1.3 percent points to 23 percent. That means that of all the um, 21,561 individual board seats that we analyzed, uh, 4,950 were occupied by female representatives. So there is still room for improvement, but it's also a great, um, great thing to see that the trend is moving into the right direction. Um, in terms of top ranked exchanges, the highest percentage of board seats held by women um, were in companies listed on the Euronex Paris uh, with 45% uh, of board seats there being held by female representatives. Um, the exchange meets this ranking a second year in a row, so congratulations to Euronext on a continued great result. Um, the next three exchanges within the G20 ranking, the London Stock Exchange Group, the Borsa Italiana and the Deutsche Börse, were also part of the top four ranking last year. So um, congratulations to all the four exchanges there uh, on, um, on keeping, keeping the positions and also on um, improving, um, improving the um, percentage of uh, women on boards. Um, it's also noteworthy that the Johannesburg Stock Exchange for a second year in a row uh, is the only emerging market in the G20 that is, the, that is above the G20 average with regards to uh, their issue as board diversity. But I'd like to mention that in the report that I'm going to present in a second, the regional report, we also have the Nairobi Securities Exchange and the Bursa Malaysia, uh, and we have a representative from the Bursa Malaysia here. Um, they both also have um, great results that are exceeding the G20 average. So congratulations on that. That's really great news. Um, because we are creating trend lines over the coming years, uh, we are tracking the individual market year-to-year -year change. And you can see that here in the table in the column with the green and red numbers. Um, the Indonesian Stock Exchange had the um, highest increase uh, over the past year with 4.4 percent points um, over the 2021 result. Um, that is an amazing improvement for one year a trend that we like to see across the board. Um, and of course, we're looking forward to seeing how that is going to develop in the future. Um, 
We are also looking at the percentage of companies in, uh, in a market which have no women on boards at all. Uh, in this year's ranking, there are actually five markets in the G20 in which every company that is listed in, and is included in the top 100 um, issuers by market capitalization has at least one woman on board. So all top 100 issuers on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, on the New York Stock Exchange, on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and on the Borsa Italiana have at least one woman on board. So there are no only male boards in, um, in those markets. Um, apart from the boards, we also considered, as Anthony mentioned earlier, the percentage of share positions and the percentage of CEO positions held by, uh, by women. In total, the percentage of uh, female CEOs in the G20 countries grew from 3.5% to 5% this year. So uh, it's great to see improvement, no matter how small it is. And um, that means translated that uh, 140 of the 2,171 companies that we analyzed are being led by women. Uh, the percentage of share, share positions remain the same at uh, 5% as well. So you see lots of really good data packed into this small chart. And I only picked out a few key highlights. Amy also gave you a, key, a few key highlights. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at the G20 report yourself. You can also find the iteration from 2021 on our publication, publications website. So you can compare the numbers yourselves. Um, but I'd like to move on just to give us more time for the, for the discussion round later to uh, the regional report. In short, the methodology, the way we look at the data, the way we present it and we collected it remains the same as for the G20 report. Um, again, we are looking at the gender diversity of the top 100 issuers, um, and we also take into consideration the gender of the CEO and share positions. The difference is for this report, oops, there we go. There is the, there's the heart of the report again. Uh, we um, took into consideration the top five largest exchanges by market capitalization um, in seven different regions and sub-regions, and then, of course, again, the top 100 issuers. These criteria resulted in a sample of 3,246 companies. Uh, the regions that we considered are uh, Europe, Africa, Southeast Asia, um, South America, Eastern Asia, Western Asia, and then one group which we call USCAN, which is um, a slightly uh, edited group from the um, usually used UN group uh, JUSCAN, which includes uh, Canada. Our group here includes US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, Unfortunately, the chart didn't fit on one slide completely, so I'm going to jump between the two um, here, um, depending on which group I'm talking about. But you can also um, open the links in the chat box, and then you will have you will have one big oops, one big uh, table on one on one page, and it might be easier for you to follow. So the largest exchanges in Europe um, had the highest percentage of board seats held by women uh, with a group average of 35%. And um, they also had the lowest percentage of companies with all male boards. So only 2% of all top 100 companies listed on uh, one of the European exchanges included here in our country group um, have no female representative on their boards. Um, we found also that the five African exchanges that we included in our study um, had the highest proportion of female CEOs, 9%, um, closely followed by the Southeast Asian market with 8%. You can see that here. Um, and in fact, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and also um, the Stock Exchange of Thailand had the highest number of female CEOs among the top issuers within their markets um, with 15%. Um, the most board chair positions were found in our uh, youth pen group uh, with 12% of boards being shared by women. 
And NASDAQ, uh, located in the US, is here the market with the highest proportion of all of board, uh, boards shared by a woman. Um, within the group, and you can also find this uh, tape or this um, this chart in our in our report within the groups, we found quite quite a wide spread. Amy already mentioned that earlier in her remarks. Um, so the highest and lowest percentage of board seats held by women in within the group can be quite different. For example, in, in the European region, um, which has the highest uh, percentage of female board members as total, we found a widespread with, with over 20 percent points difference between the uh, top and the bottom market. A similar situation can be observed also in Africa and um, similarly in Western, uh, Western Asia. So these are some key highlights that might get us started for, for the discussion. Um, many of the numbers remain fairly small. Others are already very close to gender parity. Uh, I think overall there's still room for improvement over the coming years. So we're really looking forward to continuing this research together with our partners. And we hope to see the trends improve in the right direction over the coming years. Um, Anthony, back to you. Thank you very much for that, Lisa. Thanks for walking us through these two, two separate reports uh, and a lot of data out there. <clears throat> Again, all of these reports are available to download in the chat. They're also available on our website. They're very concise. They're very uh, data centric. Um, and we hope they'll help many of you uh, to better understand how your market positions with other markets and mm -hmm. help you start to think about how you can uh, take action in your market to advance gender equality there. We'd now like to go to some of our speakers to reflect on this data and reflect on the broader issues that this data touches upon. And first, I'd like to go to our, our good friend, uh, Jamshed and, and colleague from UN Women. UN Women is a, a, a strategic partner in this work. Uh, we've been working with them for a, several years now in our Ring the Bell for Gender Equality events with stock exchanges around the world, but also They've been a strategic partner for our guidance on how stock exchanges can advance gender equality in the marketplace and the first benchmarking report that we produced last year. Um, John Shed, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Anthony. Just a, a technical check that you can hear me fine. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, uh, so good morning and, uh, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm really delighted to join you today for this webinar on uh, gender equality and corporate leadership that presents the results and analysis of issuers on G20 stock exchanges. It's also great to see some familiar faces and also very good representation from the ASEAN region, which is uh, where I'm also located here in Jakarta. Um, I apologize in advance as I may not be able to stay for the entire session as I literally have a flight to catch. This was my, my last sort of uh, commitment and I wanted to be here uh, with you today. Um, I would like to thank the uh, IFC and Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative for inviting me. Um, uh, I'm, I'm here also on behalf of my colleagues uh, at headquarters who are also who have been very much in, in, in close contact with you all. Uh, we really appreciate the continued collaboration and strategic partnership uh, uh, with, with you. Um, women's active participation and decision making in the economy is, is crucial for long term economic prosperity. Um, UN Women supports women's economic empowerment in line with many international commitments together with the various stakeholders. Um, UN Women was particularly pleased to be working closely with the co-chair of Indonesia's B20, the Business 20, and we worked together to ensure a strong focus on gender equality throughout the sessions, uh, gender diverse panels, as well as having uh, our very own UN Women Goodwill Ambassador uh, Academy Award winner Anne Hathaway addressed the B20 summit, where she paid particular attention to the issues around the care economy and the burden of unpaid care work, which uh, hinders uh, many women from, uh, you know, you know, realizing their full potential in the workforce. So, in that regard, I mean, uh, I was lucky to be here in Jakarta, in Bali, uh, for for the B20 uh, proceedings. And we very much look forward to continuing our support through India's G20 presidency as well with our office uh, in New Delhi. Uh, the G20 countries represent about 60% of the world's population and 80% of global GDP. Yet um, we see even in large economies, enhancing women's leadership is a key ongoing challenge. 
And if we just look at women's leadership in the G20 countries, and uh, uh, I will uh, be, I guess, uh, covering some of the same data sets that others, other speakers before me have. Um, so uh, please bear with me. Uh, women represent a very small segment of public sector leadership roles. So uh, we only have one woman head of state, uh, the prime minister of Italy, and the president of the European Commission, who's also a woman. Um, and in G20 countries, women make on average about 28% of the seats in the parliament. Um, and if you look at the private sector, the recent data seems to suggest that uh, the private sector is trailing slightly behind the public sector in this regard. So only 5% of the G20's top 100 listed companies have women CEOs, and that's an increase of 1.5% from the previous year. We also observe slightly better situation of women in key C-suite roles, so 8.9% across G20 countries, um, and 23% of board seats were held by women in the private sector. So good progress has been made, but considerable work lies ahead to see these numbers improve. Uh, stock exchanges and other capital market shareholders play an important role in promoting gender equality through leadership, strengthening market performance, and promoting gender-focused products. And at UN Women, we have been actively engaging with stock exchanges across the world, in particular the Women Empowerment Principles, or the WEPS uh, team, has been working closely with the stock exchanges around the globe to advance gender equality and women's empowerment. Uh, the WEPS is a global initiative that provides a blueprint for the private sector to advance gender equality and women's empowerment in the workplace, marketplace, and the community. In 2021, together with IFC and the International Capital Market Association, we have published guidelines, uh, bonds to bridge the gender gap, that provides practical guidance on how to use sustainable bonds to credibly access finance for projects that advance gender equality and achieve lasting impact. Uh, and as some of the speakers have noted already, for nearly a decade, we have been organizing the Ring the Bell for Gender Equality event for International Women's Day with IFC and SSE. Uh, for the past year's event, I, I believe 110 exchanges have joined. Many of these exchanges have adopted the WEPs, and we expect to see more exchanges participate and adopt uh, the women's empowerment principles uh, in 2023 and beyond. So moving on, I would like to highlight some key points from this year's uh, market monitor on G20. The market monitor zooms into a key metric, women on boards. While, while this is a somewhat simplified metric to measure gender equality, it is the most adopted indicator by exchanges and issuers across the world. So we call on exchanges and issuers to expand their collection of gender disaggregated data so that we can have a more comprehensive analysis of progress being made. The WEPS transparency and accountability framework provides further guidance on other metrics. So before concluding, I would like to acknowledge and congratulate uh, the Indonesia Stock Exchange for having improved the most in terms of gender equality among the exchanges in G20 countries since last year. And as well as was uh, noted, the Euronext Paris that continues to have the highest percentage of women on boards in G20, 45% uh, of women in the top 100 issuers. And among the exchanges in emerging markets, only the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, as was mentioned, showed results above the G20 average. 80% of corporate boards had at least one woman board member. However, this is still not enough. So in terms of the way forward, we call on exchanges and their issuers to do three things. One, commit to and adopt the women's empowerment principles. Two, develop a corporate gender policy measures and set targets. Three, carry out regular board evaluations, the culture, the composition, effectiveness and performance to identify gender equality gaps and challenges. I look forward to learning more about this year's market monitors finding at today's event. So thank you very much for having me. Back to you. Thank you very much, John Shedden. I know you've got a tight schedule, so we do appreciate you sharing the time with us. And it's great also to hear another voice from Southeast Asia. Of course, you're you're surrounded by a lot of markets that are doing remarkably well. And so we'd like to go to Bursa Malaysia next as a speaker who, uh, Bursa Malaysia uh, with 24% of board seats uh, in the top 100 companies on the exchange held by women. Uh, it ranks out the top in Southeast Asia. And, and we're also going to be hearing from 
uh, Veronica at the Philippine Stock Exchange, which, which ties for second place with the uh, Stock Exchange of Thailand. Um, so really great uh, performance to, in Southeast Asia. Um, Ken, can you give us uh, some, some of your thoughts about this data and about some of the activities that you're taking there at Bursa Malaysia to help uh, promote women in, in corporate leadership? Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for inviting Bursa Malaysia to share our reflections pertaining to gender equality on corporate boards. It's really heartening to see the significant progress made by all the jurisdictions covered in the study, you know, across the Southeastern Asia region. So even though our average is uh, almost close to 20%, there is still a sizable gap when you compare that to, you know, more developed jurisdictions. Well, what I can say is that within the Malaysian context, Abusa Malaysia has been pretty proactive on this front. We have actually enhanced our listing requirements to require all PLCs to have at least one woman on their boards, you know, by June of 2020. Now, this is not really captured within the report at the moment, but the rule change is impactful because all male boards will be a thing of the past for Malaysia by the middle of next year. So since the introduction of the requirement, we're very happy to say that the percentage of board seats held by women on our top 100 PLCs have actually gone up from the reported 24% to approximately 29% as at December 2022. So nothing beats, you know, mandating this, you know, when it comes to moving the needle for gender equality. So even though we take a lot of pride in the significant progress made in the overall proportion of women directors across all PLCs, um, I think for the overall population of PLCs, we are at around 21% at last count. There is still much more work to be done. At this juncture, uh, if you look at all of the PLCs listed on Bursa Malaysia, about 171 out of 863 still have all male boards. Now, coming back to the UNSSE report, um, I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to the proportion of women holding the positions of board chair as well as CEO because it remains quite low. Now, on a separate uh, development, we have also enhanced our sustainability reporting framework where PLCs are mandated to disclose a set of common sustainability themes and indicators. One such theme is diversity. So starting uh, the financial year and 31st December 2023, reporting in early 2024, all PLCs have to you know, disclose the percentage of employees by gender and age group for every employee category and the percentage of directors also by gender and age group. So we are trying to drive, you know, enhance transparency of performance on the diversity front. Now, overall, um, lessons learned, we realized very early on that we cannot do this alone. Key players across the entire ecosystem have to work in a close and integrated manner in order to further this board and senior management diversity agenda. So we work with lots of outfits across our capital market, um, our Securities Commission, 30% Club Malaysia Chapter, Institute of Corporate Directors Malaysia, on various initiatives to nudge our corporates to keep improving their diversity-related practices as well as disclosures. One thing that's worth mentioning, very, very impactful, is board mentoring schemes to accelerate the appointment of more women into board positions. Okay, so the building of that pool and pipeline of talent is absolutely critical. So we have also devoted a lot of resources and effort you know, to get our PLCs closer to that magical 30% average, which is our national aspiration. So we also have quite a number of uh, advocacy programs that we run, including our Empowerment Women series, all the way to running interactive exchange theaters that seek to highlight various unconscious gender-based biases on boards to break the glass barrier. So we are also a PLC listed on our own exchange and uh, happy to say that 30% of USA's own board is made up of women. So we are walking the talk as well. So that's some of the lessons learned from our jurisdiction. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that. That was a real tour de force. Uh, very impressive there. Uh, a few takeaways, uh, you know, when you say nothing beats mandating this, that is, uh, you know, we've certainly seen some correlation between uh, mandatory uh, efforts and, and really jumpstarting and boosting numbers in this space. But you also talked on a lot of other activities that you're doing that are, are, are complementary to those activities. You, you mentioned board mentoring schemes. Also very important, you know, if we're honest, a lot of boardrooms, they, they represent the kind of old boy network, and it's a lot of informal connections that people know each other and ask them to sit on each other's boards and so on. So it's really important to, to use also the similar kind of informal mechanisms to help women integrate into boards. So that's very good. You, you, you mentioned the 30% club that you're working with. We're having them speak on our, our next webinar, which is going to be in the middle of the night for you. So, <laughs> But um, we've also collaborated with them. And, and I, I think that's also part of our recommendations that exchanges, you know, this, is, this burden does not fall squarely on your shoulders. You should reach out to other partners who can assist you with this journey. And I, I think you've demonstrated that. Um, and so really very interesting. You also touched on finally that this issue of board chair and CEO positions remain low. And that's something true around the world. When we look at these numbers around the world, and that is one of these issues we often refer to as a pipeline issue, um, which is because a lot of people who sit on boards are either current or former CEOs of other companies. And so if you don't have a lot of women as CEO positions, then it's, it's, you end up with this result that there's not a lot of women on boards, and so there's a challenge. But in general, Ken, thanks a lot for that intervention. All these multi-activities that you're doing to break that glass ceiling, and I think that's what's really required is a mix of different things, informal, formal, educational, and in some cases, uh, regulatory. So thank you very much for that, Ken, and congratulations to Bursa Malaysia on the great success you've had. And and also, I'd like to congratulate you for actually tracking these numbers. I, I, we're, we're happy that you have your own numbers. And we, you know, we know that these numbers can vary depending on the sample size and so on. But so we 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 think all exchanges should certainly track this, because if you don't measure it, you can't you can't uh, really achieve progress. How do you know when you're achieving progress if you're not measuring? So great job. Um, Veronica, we'd like to go to Philippine Stock Exchange. Also did very well in Southeast Asia and uh, came in in the second place uh, with the Stock Exchange of Thailand. Um, again, the Philippine Stock Exchange has been a, a collaborator with the SSE for many years on the Ring the Bell for Gender Equality events, and you've been a longtime member of the SSE. Can you tell us uh, more about your thoughts on these this, this data and your thoughts on what your exchange is doing to advance gender equality in your marketplace? That's right, Annie. Anthony, thank you very much. First, thanks to the UN SSE and IFC for inviting us to this event. And congratulations on the launch of the reports on gender equality benchmark. We're very happy to have landed in the second place in the Southeast Asian markets region in terms of the number of um, board seats held by women directors. Uh, well, we find the reports to be a very useful and informative tool for exchanges now in tracking their and their listed companies' progress towards promoting gender equality and their performance vis-a-vis -vis their peers in the group average. Um, it gives us meaningful insights on where we are now uh, where we want to be in the future, and it pushes us to identify gaps in our existing pal policies. Um, I recall that uh, when the SSC and other partner organizations released a paper in 2017 on how, stock, on how stock exchanges can advance gender equality, one of the key issues identified for the private sector was um, female representation in corporate leadership. So, so we are very pleased to note from the report that there has been um, notable and significant improvements in this space. Um, for example, issuers in G20 stock exchanges are adding more women to their boards and senior management. And I noted also that 18 of the 22 markets um, registered a positive year-on-year -year change in the percentage of board seats held by women. Um, closer to home or in the Southeast Asian region, we are also happy to see that Southeast, Southeastern Asian markets have the second highest proportion of female CEOs of listed companies with 8%. And in terms of board seats held by women, PSE ranks second within its regional group uh, with 19%. Uh, however, as pointed out by Amy and Lisa earlier, um, there's still substantial room for improvement as women continue to be underrepresented or even unrepresented in senior management and on corporate boards in some markets. Um, 
like based on the regional analysis report, um, 15% of the top 100 issuers in the PSE have no women on their board. So I think that's something that um, we need to improve upon. It also appears that top leadership is still predominantly male since only 5% and 8% of the chair and CEO positions respectively are held by women. Now that presents an opportunity for stock exchanges to make a significant contribution because as market standard setters and in some cases regulators, uh, like in our case, exchanges are uniquely positioned to encourage or even mandate listed companies to take certain action towards improving um, gender equality. In the Philippines, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Philippine Stock Exchange promote transparency by including a gender component in the sustainability report. Um, listed companies are required to disclose in the annual corporate governance report their policy on board diversity and to indicate the gender composition of their board. So they have to identify like how many female directors have they, have, um, they have in their boards vis-a-vis -vis the male directors. While this is an a comply or explain approach, um, it makes a compelling case for listed companies to increase female representation in the board and senior management roles, especially now that more investors like the big funds, the institutional investors are adopting a gender lens investing strategy and paying more attention to gender diversity. And I think um, the fact that the Securities and Exchange Commission and the PSE require this disclosure also signals that the regulators recognize gender equality as a top priority development goal. So that sends a very positive signal to the community. Um, PSE also raises awareness by organizing forums for publicly listed companies on the topics of safe spaces at work, um, and gender components in sustainability reporting. Um, in 2021, we conducted a training for listed companies entitled Inclusion of Gender in Sustainability Reporting of listed companies as well as for private companies. This was in partnership with um, the Asian Institute of Management and UN Women. So um, this is part of our capacity building programs and we plan to continue having similar types of capacity building workshops in the future and um, to continue to partner with international and local organizations whose advocacy is to um, promote and advance gender equality. Um, I'd also like to mention that PSE, along with six other ASEAN exchanges, I don't know if Bursa Malaysia is part of it, um, they created, uh, we created an ESG working group to establish a common set of ASEAN ESG metrics. And among the core metrics that were agreed to be included upon, or included our percentage of um, the enterprise headcount held by men and women, um, the percentage of men and women holding entry-level and mid-level positions that can ultimately advance to um, more senior um, management positions, and the percentage of senior and executive level positions held by men and women. So these developments also highlight um, the ASEAN exchange's growing commitment to gender equality in the business sector. Um, PSC will continue to work with all relevant stakeholders to achieve that goal of um, gender equality. Um, if I may also mention, um, PSE was the first stock exchange in Southeast Asia to sign the statement of support for the women empowerment um, principles. Uh, we've also been a constant participant since 2018 in the Ring the Bell for gender equality. Um, in terms of leading by example, um, PSE also takes pride in having substantial female representation in various leadership roles internally, like four of our 15 directors um, and two of Two of um, the six division heads are women. Our wholly owned subsidiaries, two wholly owned subsidiaries are also headed by women. Um, there are two times more women department heads than men. So that's a two is to one ratio. Um, and in terms of the entire PSD population, 50%, 53% rather of employees are women. Um, and then lastly, PSD practices gender equality in hiring and um, career advancement opportunities. So I guess it's also important for the employees and candidates to know that we adhere to a hiring principle based on skills and without um, gender bias. We hope that by providing equal employment and leadership opportunities for women, um, PSC is able in some way to influence company behavior or listed companies behavior and promote um, gender equality in the financial sector. Thank you very much for that, Veronica. That's a, it's a, again a very a very broad set of activities, and I think that's really what uh, we see as best practice. If you look at the the SSE guidance on, on gender advancing gender equality, 
what we refer to as the action wheel, which has all these different actions. Uh, many of those actions are things that you've just touched on here. And I, I think it's important, as we also heard from Ken in, in Malaysia, that you, it's not just one thing that's going to move this forward, because it is, of course, a very complex topic. But it's the many different things that you mentioned uh, that, of course, the Philippine Stock Exchange has some regulatory powers. So it's, you know, you both have the the soft power of encouraging, but potentially even mandating activity in the space. You also mentioned uh, training, um, and that is critically important. This is a role that all stock exchanges are engaged in, which is market education. And there are many different topics you can include under the umbrella of market education, and certainly gender equality is one of those. Um, and to that effect, the SSE working with the IFC and other partners we hope to provide more resources for exchanges next year to, to deliver training to their marketplace in this topic. So we may follow up with you and Veronica to learn more about your experiences in this area. Uh, in particular, you were mentioning on corporate reporting, which is critically important. I mean, we work today, we're presenting data on the on an entire market, but it's very good for each individual company to do their part to understand what does their company look like? Um, you know, are there problem areas and are is there progress? Um, and you mentioned the work of the exchange itself, and I think that's very important. We also heard from Ken in Malaysia about what's happening in the, their exchange. It's very important because we always will say that the stock exchange, it, it has to lead by example, um, especially it's many exchanges like Malaysia, you're, you're listed on your own exchange, and it's it's difficult for you to ask your issuers to do something. If, if you're not doing it yourself, they will naturally question that. So. I think the things that you listed, uh, Veronica, about what's happening at PSE are are very inspirational uh, and hopefully will in, encourage other uh, other companies in your marketplace. You also mentioned the the WEPS, which of course the Women Empowerment Principles, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, this is something from the UN Women, uh, and it's uh, if you there's inf more information about this in our guidance document. But if any exchanges on this call would like to learn more about this, feel free to contact us and we're happy to, to help you with that. Um, or you may wanna contact your peers, you may wanna contact Veronica and, and say, how did that help them in their own marketplace? So I really appreciate that. And, and, and lastly, I just, uh, just to note this ASEAN working group and the ESG metrics, You know, again, coming back to corporate reporting, very important. This is a challenge um, is to, to really come up with standardized measurements for things. You know, there's a lot of reporting about women and senior management, but that phrase senior management can sometimes be very fuzzy, you know, exactly what that means. Um, so it's good to come up with some sort of taxonomies and, and standards that, that people can report against. Otherwise, it's, again, difficult to measure progress. Thank you very much, Veronica, for joining in, and congratulations on all the, the great efforts there. And, um, you know, we look forward to, to working with you on this journey and uh, hopefully we'll be enjoying more progress in this area the next few years. So we have a few minutes left uh, to open the floor for questions, uh, comments. I know there's a lot of other exchanges on the call. We have with us also, uh, we're lucky to have with us uh, Shamila Subramoni from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Um, Shamila, can I invite you to turn on your camera and unmute your mic? Um, and tell us a little bit about what's happening at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Of course, one of the exchanges that does very well on this metric. Hi, Anthony, and hi to everyone on the line. Please forgive me for not putting my camera on. I'm just back from almost three weeks of sick leave and um, just catching my breath. So I'm just getting there. Yeah. Uh, but Anthony, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. These are obviously not uh, prepared remarks and uh, more impromptu. But firstly, thank you very much, the SSE and the IFC, for this really, really useful work. And doing this for us in our markets, I think the insights are invaluable. So very grateful for that. And um, and good to see the JSE featuring, you know, uh, above the G20 averages, the only emerging market, also very encouraging. I think that um, it was also lovely to reflect on colleagues from other markets and to hear and learn from really exciting things that they're doing. I can't concur more on the point of the need for an ecosystems approach to the improvement of gender representation. It's never gonna be a go it alone for an exchange or for a regulator because the numbers are one thing, 
but the culture that supports that, that really empowers women, I think is an entirely different thing in many instances. And, you know, we won't go into the detail about uh, that, but I think it'd be well known to anybody on the board that one of the most difficult things is once you've promoted a woman to actually keep her there. And we're seeing that attrition rate around the world is a very tough thing um, to actually, it's, it's very tough to actually try and maintain those. So I think those are some of the reflections. So on the JSC itself, a few things to note is the first one is that there are no mandatory targets. Um, and despite that, we're seeing quite significant, you know, numbers in there, but of course that's nowhere near enough. I mean, if I just look at the CEO representation, 9% is nine out of a hundred, you know, <laughs> where's the rest? If we get to 50, that's kind of like another, what, 48, 40, 41 to go if my maths are right, to get us to 50. But so there's a lot that needs to be done, but it's encouraging that the trends are going in the right direction in many markets. This is for me particularly notable on the back of pandemic, where we've seen a lot of issues impact gender equality, and in fact, a widening of the gap in many instances. To see that if that companies around the world are still making that effort, I think is noteworthy, and we're hoping, Anthony, that you'll see that trend continue as you track these figures uh, going into the few other years, that, you know, into future years. The next one is that despite the fact that there are no mandatory targets as in, you know, exchange listings requirements, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what we do have are mandatory disclosure requirements. And I do think that that has had a very strong impact on the market, because, of course, once that information is in the public domain, I don't think anybody wants to be seen to be backtracking, right, and to be decreasing, and then that is being tracked. So then to elaborate on the point of, um, united effort and kind of ecosystems approach. There are many, many entities within the country that are looking at that. There are sectoral initiatives, for example. There are codes within different sectors where they particularly are looking at gender numbers. And all of that serves together to prop up, I think, the kinds of numbers we're seeing. The exchange itself partners with quite a large initiative uh, called the Gender Mainstreaming Awards, which again has a positive impact on the market because you know once those records are publicly collated, people can see that information, you become conspicuous by your absence if you're not there, and even worse so if you seem to have backtracked right on your numbers. So those are some of the things I think that have uh, helped us trend in that direction the sectoral level initiatives, it's been critically important for the exchange to stay involved with all of those beyond just regulatory, mandatory, or any other disclosure requirements. Secondly, I think we're hoping that um, in propping up the actual issues that support, I'm going to say inclusion rather than just the numbers, right? Because you want participation and, and to see the real dividend being yielded from the participation of women is to be able to track other things that underpin that, like pay equality and the like, participation at different sectors, different levels has been already highlighted and I won't elaborate. Um, and I think there is where our disclosure guidance issued this year will play a supportive role because it goes into a fair amount of granularity looking at issues like pay equality, inclusion of women in the workforce. And then also to say that our disclosure, the mandatory disclosure requirement recently changed from a gender diversity disclosure requirement to a broader diversity requirement. So embracing diversity in all its forms has been where we're going to. So we expect to see that we will continue to see the gender uh, delineation because it's critical, but hopefully what that does is per action across into greater diversity in all its forms. Um, the JSC itself, of course, I think, um, is making significant effort to walk the talk. Uh, we have our second successive female CEO. So we've now had a woman at the helm from 2012. So that's 10 years of a female CEO um, and the second successive female CEO, which I think is, is quite something in, in these markets. Um, and of course, over 60% female executive committee and board uh, of the exchange itself. So you might accuse her for swinging to find the other direction, mm -hmm. but um, it certainly served us well and has been, for me, I think personally, such a proud thing to be able to see the effort that's being made. And um, and also for noteworthy that a number of those executive positions, you know, often with gender equality, we tend to see the, in inverted commas, softer positions being filled by women um, that are not necessarily seen as very strategic or hard hitting, um, and so at the JSE, that's also noteworthy. Uh, you know, our, our CFO, our chief financial officer is a woman, the third successive woman, actually, 
and that's been appointed as a CFO at the JSE. The head of strategy is a woman. And, uh, you know, a number of the really uh, core strategic functions are actually also there. So I think that's another important dimension to look at is that where decision making is influenced, do we have women in those places to bring in and, like I said, realize the dividend of having women uh, in those positions? That is a conversation across the board. But Anthony, I want to end on a slightly more sobering note which is to say that despite all of these numbers, I think we mustn't be blind to the fact that, for example, South Africa is also home to some of the worst gender-based violence in the world. And the economic participation of women we know is directly correlated to the reduction in those kinds of things. And so whilst numbers are great, participation, understanding these underlying issues and realizing that this is a scourge that is not only in South Africa is very important. Um, and I think that's something that each of us should embrace and take home and see as needing to do our part to change, to really try and, like I said, be able to reap the benefits of having broader representation and including this critical part of, of, the, of the population in the economy. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you very much, Shamila. And um, uh, I don't want to tax your voice too much because I know you're just recovering from a cold, uh, but I, I did want to touch on a few of these things. Again, there's some common themes that we're hearing from all of our, our speakers today, again, about reporting, the importance of metrics. Um, as Shamila mentioned, the, the no company that starts to report on these metrics wants to be seen as backtracking. The other common theme is collaboration with partners, that of course, stock exchanges aren't expected to be the, the, the center of excellence on this topic, but they do have that convening power and that networking power to bring in important partners. Uh, and again, the other common theme of leading by example, what does the exchange do? I mean, how can it ask its issuers to do something if it's not doing it itself? The last thing you were talking about, uh, Shamila, about violence against women, of course, is critically important. I'd just like to flag that uh, uh, the stock exchange in Kuwait recently hosted an event on this topic in their country. And so it's, it's something that exchanges can engage on to raise awareness and bring attention to this topic. And lastly, Shamila, I did want to come back to you just very briefly, because I know we only have a few minutes left in this call, but we did get a, a question uh, the, from Kevin uh, Carlo Lacotte, who asked in our Q&A thing, he was asking about in Africa that many women lack knowledge about stock exchanges, and how can we help more women to join these markets? And I think that touches upon your point about economic in participation and inclusion, um, we heard from Veronica earlier about gender lens investing, but there, there's kind of two things here. One is investing vehicles that are targeting uh, women's empowerment, but another one is maybe market education programs or other special programs to help involve and include women in the marketplace. Shamila, I, I believe JSE has been active in these kind of market education and inclusion programs. Uh, in just a minute, if you will, could you touch on those? Certainly, Anthony, and, and completely to your point, it has to be a concerted effort to include women um, because, you know, we could very easily, if we're not careful, end up with a problem where we actually exacerbate inequality by focusing on people who are already there, already included and giving them more and more opportunities, <laughs> excuse me, making enough effort to look at the stratification below that as to who's actually included and who isn't. Now, in a country like ours with massive inequality and unemployment, you can see already that there's an issue. Secondly, if you dig deep into the data, it impacts women disproportionately, uh, disproportionately negatively, I should say. And so when you talk about participation in the market, that might be a luxury for very few. And so how do you bring up the rest? Firstly, just, excuse me, sorry, Anthony, <laughs> to get included. And then secondly, that. So education is the first step. Firstly, getting more people educated, you know, and of course, I'm talking from a developing country perspective. In our country, we have very particular issues, and uh, but that's not uncommon to a number of different economies, right, in our position. Education, first and foremost, is, is particularly important. Secondly, a very, very determined focus on women and the issues that plague them. I mean, simple things like I'm, I'm going to talk about what we call what we, they refer to as period poverty. You know, there are a number of women, of girls that do not attend a significant amount of schooling during their, 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 their puberty years because they're menstruating and they don't go to school because they don't have the sanitary uh, where to be able to provide that and therefore prefer to stay at home. 
So if you're taking out three or four days a month from schooling, what is the impact of that on education and then the long-term impact on economic inclusion for people who've missed out a significant proportion of their actual schooling life? So those are the kinds of issues that one needs to actually unpack. And unfortunately, they're not easy, but those are the things that will eventually actually deal with getting women into the workforce. Once they're included, then we can talk about participation in the markets. However, there is the dual approach is to say, for example, at a school level, one can certainly make a concerted effort to help education on the markets and inclusion. I mean, when I, my example, when I did accounting at school, nobody told me how to invest in the stock exchange. Hmm. But those are the things we need to change, right? Because these are the life skills that are going to be critical to understand and to go from book learning to practical life skills. So those are the types of things that JSC, for example, sponsors uh, education, you know, education challenge or investment challenge that goes down to schools level. And it makes a particular effort to go to schools in underprivileged areas to both support the education, to enable those children to participate, and then gives them obviously a, quite a bit of, you know, rah-rah and support to be able to do that. And so that investment challenge goes from school level to university level and includes a, num a growing number of schools targeted at those populations that are not typically included. And so those are some of the things we could do. And it takes a lot of effort to do that, a lot of investment in time, effort and money. The other thing we've done over time is to help actually inform the curriculum, the national curriculum, to start including elements of financial education and things like that. And those are some of the ways in which we can do that. And so that's generally bringing education on board, which girls and women, of course, benefit from. And then secondly, there's another big event that we host annually, which is focused on women, and that is an investment um, uh, a sort of a day that is, you know, everything that is very attractive to women and have a lot of women speaking at those events, teaching people how to invest and annually oversubscribed, you know, uh, people coming into the exchange, you find that very exciting joining online, but dealing with some of the issues that women have, the softer issues as well as the hard go. So how do you invest? Where do you go? Who should you be speaking to? And what should that look like? So those, I think, Anthony, are some of the ways in which we try to bridge that divide, but realizing that there are very different challenges the lower you go into that kind of value chain. Thank you very much for that, Shamila. Um, I really, you know, I spoke earlier about this kind of pipeline issue, but I think you've really just lengthen that pipeline quite a bit. It goes all the way into uh, childhood and education opportunities and the differences in education opportunities for, for girls and boys growing up um, and how that then later on affects their careers and also their financial inclusion. So I think those are good food for thought for other exchanges on this call about how they can broaden their activities. You mentioned partnerships with educational institutions, which is very good. And and then this day, you've got this annual event. Uh, maybe these things could be aligned with uh, Ring the Bell for Gender Equality. Other exchanges could adopt similar practices to promote financial inclusion and, and financial education. Listen, we are over by two minutes, but I, I, this has been a very rich discussion. I, 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 we could go on. Uh, and I encourage all of you, if you have questions from this call that we didn't have a chance to answer, to please reach out to us bilaterally. Um, if there's anybody on this call that you heard speak that you'd like to follow up with and you don't already have their contact information, feel free to contact us and we'll connect the dots. I would like to thank you again, our, our speakers, Ken and Veronica, for joining us. Congratulations on the great efforts in your markets. It's obviously we still have more to do, but it's important to celebrate uh, milestones. And uh, I think you've both been doing very well. And I'd like to thank Shamila for joining us despite having a rough voice from uh, a few weeks of having a cold. Uh, thank you all for your commitment to this. Uh, again, the reports are available on our website. And if you have any questions or, or comments, or you'd like to follow up, up with us bilaterally, please do not hesitate to, to reach out to us. Thank you all. This now ends our, our quarterly webinar, and I hope everyone has a great end of year holiday season, and we'll see you all in the new year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.